Philadelphia, are you ready? <laughs> no, he said, are you ready? This is Brotherly Love Wrestling Podcast, your first stop for everything professional wrestling. So sit back and enjoy wrestling talk at its finest with your hosts, Larry Hall and Joe Corrado. Welcome to another edition of Brotherly Love Wrestling Presents Fallout. And this week, we have the now joining us, Hale Collins and Vic Delicious. Guys, welcome. What's up, guys? Hey, what's going on? Thank you for having us. Well, thank you so much for coming on to this, uh, still the infancy of this new show that we are doing, Fallout, our debate show. And um, this is... Nice work. We are thank you. <laughs> we are splitting up into teams. Me and Joe will be on opposite teams. It will be Joe and Hale and me and Vic. Um, we have about seven topics we're going to cover today, <laughs> all from uh, AEW to WWE to uh, even a little bit of Ring of Honor. So um, I think we should get right into it. Um, I got. Does that mean with me and Hale on a team, we can be the then? <laughs> Well, oh, no, never then. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you almost made him short circuit there, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I put I pushed Hale's only button. <laughs> it is, that's it. And and uh, barbecue chicken pizza, man. <laughs> the show will start out rough. <laughs> All uh, right, so chicken pizza, the lost episode. Joe, <laughs> since you won last time, you can you will let you guys go first. Um and would you like me to pick it or do you want to pick the topic? Uh you pick the topic and we'll decide which uh Okay, so AEW's pay-per-view was uh, a couple nights ago. We'll start out with AEW. And um, let's go with, is AEW taking too many unnecessary risks risks with their talent as far as big spots, um, guys like Darby Allen, stuff like that? And injuries and whatnot? Yes. Hale, you want to you wanna start it off? Uh, so basically it's like yes or no. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, are they taking too many risks, or are they not? Um, uh, I don't think they're taking too many risks, uh, because I, they're doing what they have to do to separate themselves. You know, like right now, I feel like the independents, you know, or the independents, but it's really pro wrestling. Um, they're doing that. That's the crowd that AEW has, so they're used to those kind of fast paced matches. Yes, they can slow it down sometimes, but I think they need it because the product that's the other alternative um, aren't doing that much like them. So it separates them for sure. Good. Good. All right. Do we have time on the clock? There is plenty of time. You, you had another 45 seconds, but, I mean, if you want to end it, you're good. If you make your point, you're good. It was such a good point that I want to hear what you two schmoes have to say about it, and then I'll come back with a fucking uppercut. The yeah, that's home. what I'm saying, you know. Vic, you can you can go ahead if you want. Okay, so if they took the no side, then we have to be on the yes side. Yes, correct. I figured this out pretty quick. Awesome. Well, then, yeah, of course they're taking way too many risks. There is absolutely no need to take that many risks when you're in the middle of a quarantine. You can absolutely positively use the power of your creativity and your marketing to reintroduce your product in such a way that it is character development and unique scenarios where it doesn't have to be guys being thrown off of goalposts and being choke slammed to hell uh, unnecessarily in front of no people. The times in my career where I had the biggest amount of adrenaline rush for big impactful scenarios like that or when I had a ton of people watching me. So I am not capable of getting into the mental space of understanding how to throw yourself off of things uh, without the 
crowd reaction behind you to help numb that pain just a little bit. So, you know, all of those things are going to have to be really important to AEW as we get down the line here because their bodies and their longevity are going to be super important in the long run. And I hate to see them wasted right now. All right. Joe, you're up. All right. So who they cater to is pretty much the, I would say, the if we were to call it any terminology, maybe the hipster style ECW hardcore type fan who – are hardcore and passionate about the product that they put on and what they've been known for since Jump Street has been putting on some over-the-top crazy matches. So that's what you hook them in with, and now there's only one way to go, and that's up. So you keep outdoing yourself. Yes, you're going to be doing some crazy things, but this is what you've accustomed your fan base to, to getting used to right now. So the more risks you take, the more they're going to enjoy it. And to be honest with you, I mean, everyone else is doing the, the safe way and whatnot, and it's proving that it's getting old and tiresome. So you got to get new and creative with your shit, and you have some talent that has a lot of imagination when it comes to moveset that staying grounded and in-ring and not taking the risk just isn't a part of that character. And I'm talking about someone like uh, a Darby Allen, a Joey Janela. I mean, like, they're known for taking risks. If you saddle them, then really you're taking away an aspect of their game that they're used to. Just in time, Joe. I'm a pro. All right, so. And humble. <laughs> I don't like having someone get. Larry doesn't make these comments. No, that makes it even better. I, I like having a teammate <laughs> like this. <laughs> God damn it. So with, <clears throat> with these unnecessary risks, and that's exactly what they are, unnecessary, when you have one of your top stars like a Darby Allen, who unquestionably is, is one of your future people that is going to lead this company, you don't need to be jumping off a ladder with a skateboard into nothing, into another ladder. If you're as innovative and if you're as creative as what we know the Young Bucks and Cody and all these wrestling minds to be, you can get it done a different way where you're not sacrificing a lot of your top talent because a lot of your top talent's doing this. Even Sammy Guevara with that golf cart a couple of weeks ago. You don't need to do that spot. I mean, you, he gets hit in the face with a golf cart. Who knows how he lands? You know what I mean? It, it, it's just unnecessary, and I think you can be way more creative with the minds that you have and do so much different and then have the longevity of those stars to keep a lot of fans happy for a long time. <clears throat> All right. So who won? Really wanted to counterpoint that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're going to find out at the end who won. We're going to put this out. Once we put it out, we will have comments, DMs, whatever anybody wants to uh, put up the vote. You can vote for Joe and Hale, or you can vote for me and Vic and uh, whoever you, the audience, thinks won. Um, we will set up a thread on our Facebook and on our Twitter account, and you can uh, comment and uh, answer there. So let's uh, move on to our second point, um, which we will choose because then we will be going first. So um, – No, wouldn't we choose it for you? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So I'm sorry, go ahead. I don't have them in front of me, but I'm going to go with number three. Okay, that was, that was the one I already used. So, the number four. Okay. So number four. Good strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Should oh, we have not even recorded it anyway, bro. <laughs> <laughs> should Flip Gordon have re-signed with Ring of Honor Wrestling, or should he have um, gone somewhere else and found a new place to go? What's the news story that's out there, though? What's the what? What's the news story that was released today? Like, what's the that he well, he signed? He came out today and said he signed a multi-year deal with Ring of Honor. So it was a multi-year contract. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, question is, should he have re-signed with Ring of Honor instead of going somewhere else? Got it. So, uh, I give it to you, Vic. What which which side do you want to go with? No. 
Okay. No. Uh, I think Wait, that. Why? Yeah. Uh, you know, in this, I think that Flip Gordon had the actually unique opportunity right now where he could um, use his ability anywhere on the planet. And I have had an opportunity to see him do some incredible things in some incredible matches. And there's never been a time where I saw Flip Gordon challenged where he didn't rise to the occasion. And from a purely selfish standpoint, I would love to see his talent and his ability showcased on the absolute maximum stage that he could possibly get. And Injuries have been a bug that has bit him a few times already in his career, and I would hate to see him waste any time in the career that he has for himself right now, not in the absolute best light possible for him. And that could be completely um, up to however he, he, I'm sure he looks at it differently than everyone else. So um, I'd like to see him on a bigger stage. All right. <clears throat> Hale, Hale, what do you got? Uh, I agree that he's, you know, I agree that he should have signed. Uh, he had new, he had a couple injuries and, you know, Bonner, you know, kept him on contract all that whole time. Um, so treating so nicely and so good. Um, why sign somewhere else where since there's a pandemic, who knows where this is going to lead. And right now he's going to, I think it's smart taking the guarantee, um, you know, and, you know, and they built him up. I don't think he's done there. I think his injury slowed his pace down a little bit. And when he comes back, he's going to be better than ever. And he's going to be able to showcase because there's a bunch of new guys. Um, He's going to be one of the top guys now. So he gets to be a top guy in a company and, and a multi-year deal guarantee. So I think, I think it's a smart move. I think uh, other places, uh, their eyes are focused on different guys. And right now, Ring of Honor is focused on him. So why not just take over and be the best with a guarantee contract? <laughs> All right. Um, I, I don't think he should have re-signed with Ring of Honor, uh, for the sheer fact of the opportunity and the matches that could come out of him not signing with Ring of Honor. Now, of course, in the future, we have no idea what kind of partnerships maybe AEW is making or anything like that. But as of right now, for not knowing anything, the amount of talent that's, that's on the AEW roster, the NXT roster, any one of these companies, not only that, you're on a bigger scale. You have bigger money bigger networks, more exposure, more chance for you to make more money, uh, get the bigger merch money, um, the health care by the bigger companies. I mean, you name it, a lot of signs point to Flip Gordon um, being better off with a bigger company. Um, but, I mean, it's just unfortunate that he re-signed because I would like to see him on a bigger, bigger scale for sure. All right, so we've already decided that Ring of Honor has no shot to become a, a big-time player or a big-time company. That's pretty much what we're saying. But, I mean, that's pretty much not out of the picture, knowing that they, they do work with New Japan. I mean, they do have the ability to get eyes on them. And maybe that signing of Flip Gordon, knowing that he could be big somewhere else, why wouldn't you not want to lock that down and see if he can potentially – bring your company out of the gutter. Not to mention, if you're going to go strictly from a business standpoint, if you're going to get signed in a pandemic, you're, they're going to lowball you, and you're not going to get maximum. You're going to go with the place that is proven and has already paid you. Now they want to keep you. So, oh, wait, I have more bargaining power here. And instead of getting lowballed anywhere else, like, say, an AEW or a WWE. And another thing is that – there's nothing that's saying that Ring of Honor isn't going to get into business with AEW at some point anyway. I mean, Marty Skrull is head of uh, talent and head of uh, promoting there. So being a huge friend of the elite and the people that are running that side of the business, 
how could you say that Ring of Honor would never be able to work with them? So if he knows something like that, not saying that that's a guarantee, but knowing something like that, like, oh, yeah, I have the potential to make money now that's guaranteed, but I also have the potential to do something great and be part of some sort of murder. All right. That's enough of that. Thank you. Good no. morning. Oh. <laughs> Literally going to be like, where is the mute button? <laughs> You're I good. just unmuted myself. <laughs> I'm back. All right. Yeah. I ramble on, baby. <laughs> you weren't that much over, though. Oh, so you're just a dick. <laughs> you were you were a good seven seconds over is when I hit it. So yeah. I gave you that in-between point. You were, you were rocking and rolling, though, man. You I were. was. Yeah. The DVD extras will be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you guys uh, get to pick. So we will pick. Um Go back to AEW, and uh, should John Moxley have walked out with the title last night? Or Saturday night, sorry. Two nights ago. Two nights ago. Hell, what you want to do? Yes. Yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. If Cody Rose should have, should have won? Is that the – No, no, it's John Moxley. John, John Moxley. Moxley. Oh. Sorry. Uh – John Moxley, yeah, yep. Okay. I, 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 say, I say, I say, yes again. <laughs> Tell us why now. Um, well, because I feel um, just like, like, like I don't, I don't, I'm not a big fan of like titles switching over so fast. You know, like John John Moxley needs like a nice, nice long run here. I know Burley came in. Um, and he's, he's hot off the press, but, um, I mean, it was a very competitive match, you know, like there was a lot of angles, like, like, you know, like a lot of like stuff they used and, but I mean, over, like, I just feel there's more length for John Moxley to like prove himself as a champion. Um, he's very well liked worldwide. Everyone knows who he is. He has a huge following. Um, and you know, Burley still has like he still has like a lot of great things ahead of him, but you know, you can't just walk in and just get the title, you know? And, um, so I think they made, I make, I think it was the right choice. John Moxley going over. All right. Jake, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this one to start off. Whoa. Someone's balls drop. <laughs> um, I don't think Moxley should have walked out as champion. Um, I think if you're building Brody Lee and the Dark Order up as uh, you have been doing over the duration oh. of when you introduced them and this exalted one, and he was going to be all powerful and he he was going to be the guy, I, I think it's time to bring him in and let him be the guy. If he if Moxley is your baby face and and you're having this heel group come in and you have this ultimate leader who is supposedly the bad guy and not Razor, but the other another bad guy. Uh, I think that he, he needs to have the title. And Moxley, I like Moxley chasing as a baby face better than him being what he is right now. And I think that a, a powerful Brody Lee, who is the man, deserved it no matter what. And I think it, it's better with the chase with Moxley. All right. So here's the problem I have with that. Uh, going into it, they're kind of booking themselves in the corner anyway, but you can't have all these former WWE talents come over and as soon as they come over, A, they get put into the prime spot and B, they win the title right away. I think this was a good point to stop that and make it look, these guys come over, they're hot, they're big names, but we've invested in this person being John Moxley, who is one of the biggest baby faces now in all of wrestling. I think if you take it off of him now and give it to Brody Lee, I think you just prove yourself as someone who now just relies on the WWE guy that comes over to win your title. I think now that Moxley has held this and Brody Lee can now build himself up into this new persona that he is because he's still new in that company. He's still a new persona. He still needs to get his – grind his teeth and really sink in and fucking prove himself now as a different entity. 
I mean, John Moxley winning stops that. So now you can build more towards that, and he can build himself up more. All right. Vic? The entire Dark Order experiment has been a an opportunity for them to show that they can launch a original concept and something that could be completely outside of the box as far as creatively something that they can do totally different. And they had an opportunity with a little bit of a buzz with the Exalted one to capitalize on that momentum and transform the Dark Order thing into, I mean, it, it could have been, it could be a lot of different things. And having that um, championship added to that group right now would be something that legitimizes them as opposed to um, just kind of like a, a, a hot shot act that they were building up just to have one, one kind of thing like that. Now it goes back to mid-card mediocrity or um, whatever the case is. So if there's a real opportunity to launch that, I think Brody Lee had a great showing. I don't think that he um, disappointed anyone with his showing, and I think that he was worthy of walking out with the championship. Uh, right. Another one I want to counterpoint. <laughs> so that picture behind you is fake, though. They're not really behind you. <laughs> <laughs> no, some people buzzing behind my head. <laughs> Fucking bogus <focused> thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joe, you pick. No, we'll let, we'll let Hell pick this one. All right, well, I don't know if he has them in front of him to pick. Just say a number like I do. One, two, or three, Hale. Um, one. Ooh. All right. So number one is, does having wrestlers as fans for these uh, now filling in as fans for these shows, does that break kayfabe for them? To them not being in character. So, I'm going to say no. It doesn't. Um, and since I already said it, I guess I'll, I'll start it off. Uh, yeah, don't uh, put your foot in your mouth and throw the <laughs> So, the reason I, I don't think it, it uh, messes with Kate Fabe at all is because – especially with uh, WWE and even AEW for that matter, you, kayfabe, kayfabe is completely different from what we knew in the 80s and the 90s, at least as fans anyway. Uh, you have an Undertaker documentary, which is one of the best things I've ever seen going on right now, where you talk about the ultimate guy to be keeping kayfabe, and even he is now letting everybody in, and you're seeing what leads up to his matches. So... Now seeing wrestlers as fans, yeah, of course they, they're they not going to be in character. It's not that much of a deal that they aren't. Um, they can still cheer for the the baby faces or boo the heels and still kind of, kind of keep kayfabe for the match itself. They don't need to be in character, and it, it isn't a bad thing that they're doing that because at least at that point you can see – a little look into the person themselves and get to see uh, who they are and a little bit of their character just as a person. So I don't think it's that bad. Fucking chomping at the bit over here. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm going to take first go at it if you don't mind. All right, go ahead. Now we've talked before Larry, you and I, and I believe even the now has joined in with this conversation that now is a great time to kind of reinvent wrestling. And now is the time to bring it back and, do something that's maybe not completely different, but maybe a throwback that your older fans will remember. Now, by them being out of character, that completely goes against what you used to know. Like, this was your time to do a fresh start. Like, have you could have them at ringside, but be, be in kayfabe, be in, be in character. Just if you're a prick – and you're in the stands, you should be standing by yourself and be a prick. And you can even cut to these people in the stands, and instead of them all cheering and whatnot and all going and doing what they're supposed to, they can have their own characters outside, not only to add to their own personal value, but to add to the show. Now you're, you're, you're seeing them like, oh, man, this guy really is a fucking cocksucker. Or, man, she, she's – or one of the girls who's out in the – 
stands is a huge baby face. She's over there freaking consoling the baby face that's down in the corner or something like that. I mean, this is a way to kind of reinvent wrestling and bring your personalities out even more in character. All right. Vic? I really escalated quickly. <laughs> um, sometimes it's a slow build. Sometimes you just got to really ram it home. <laughs> I want to make sure that I effectively answer and get my perspective from the correct side. What is the exact question? So with – with wrestlers um, being fans with these empty arena shows, yeah. are they, like, is it bad that they are breaking kayfabe and they are just themselves and not in character? Okay. Um, and, your, and our position is, no, it's not that. Correct. And theirs is, yes. Correct. <laughs> well, it, it, I was I was struggling with it being the actual part of the wrestlers being the fans as, as part of the question, or just in general, because the presentation is also a little bit different with breaking down the walls of Kayfabe right now without everybody's presenting wrestling. So when you touched on the DVD, it made me think, well, maybe it could go a little further than, or with that documentary with The Undertaker, so maybe it goes a little further than that. But as far as, we can start the time now, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I got you. Uh, but as far as that, like, that, that all counts. <laughs> <laughs> the I do not think that the wrestlers that are there. It, I don't think it hurts anything about Casey because what they're doing is a lot of their reactions are how they would react as their character, right? I mean, it's kind of like when I watch like Isaiah Scott at ringside, he's like acting like he's part of private party while he's watching dudes like moonsault into the crowd. He's like, ah! trying not to spill his cup and stuff like that like it's all about what you determine is the real part of those people and what you see is real versus what they are outside of that so i think it's really cool that we're getting a chance to see guys that are fans of wrestling being allowed to show that you're fans of wrestling one of the negatives that's always been in professional wrestling against us as wrestlers was ever being able to admit that we were fans of this and for the last like you know probably 10 years or so i guess it's become a little bit more accepted and us keep guys admitting they collect action figures and we you know all that stuff but we're fans of this too and a lot of times when wrestlers are having these shows and stuff we're all gathered around the monitors in the back reacting like that anyway so the fact that we're you're doing it out there and giving some energy to the show is just a big help all right hail um, yeah, well, I like <clears throat> kayfabe is really important. They should bring it back full balls to the wall. Like I, I feel if they're gonna be, if they're gonna be, um, they they should be hundred percent in character on the floor. So it could actually turn into a feud between two guys. Like they start fighting like real fans, you know, and it could, they could get a lot more angles out of it if they all stay in character. Plus, you know, when like if we're gonna go like. Like what I what I loved about wrestling growing up was like the characters and like the character and like every time you saw him it was it it was like a rare if you saw him outside of wrestling it was like very rare and like it was themselves but hopefully as a as an entertainer and a professional at that time they presented themselves as that character so you never really caught them outside of the character and you believed it you know and I feel like that's fun they should really bring that back I'm totally against wrestlers saying their real names on Twitter saying I'm acting as as so and so this is my gimmick like i'm against that because it's like why should i why should anyone get behind what they say you know you can be yourself just turn the volume up top of it, you know like stay in the character at all times like i feel like i live in the now constant you know and so like i feel 100 percent against the idea of breaking kayfabe and they could bring it back in a big way and joe made a valid point like hey let's reinvent the wheel again you know all right. Uh, you're letting him off easy. He was 10 seconds over there. He was just at that <laughs> limit. I'm not, believe me, my finger was on <laughs> yeah. it. was hovering to mute. He yeah. didn't want to mute it because it was hail. If it was me, I would have been yeah. muted. If it was you, <laughs> yeah, you would have been cut right off. <laughs> <laughs> I try to get all in there. <laughs> Very right. good point. That's a tough one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> All right, so number? Oh, no, we just picked for you, didn't we? 
Oh, no. Yeah, yeah then we just pick for you? Yeah, yeah you went first. Yeah. You yeah, picked for us, and we just. Yeah. All right, so how about this? Um, was it the right booking decision having Otis win the Money in the Bank briefcase? Ooh. Hey, Al, which one do you, which side do you feel more comfortable taking? I say yes. All right. Then that's what we're taking. All right. I'll go into it. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go? You can go first. All right. So you have someone that's like from a fan's perspective that is getting over substantially. And we've seen it plenty of times before when you have a tag team and you have that one person that catches fire and gets over and you can feel that they're starting to slip into the singles aspect of wrestling. Hell, you even put them with a hot blonde ballet slash wrestler, teammate, whatever you want to call her at this point. Now you shoot him to the moon even more and you run an angle where he's freaking getting betrayed by her, but not really. So that invests them even more in him. So hell, what's the next step for him? He's already on his way to a singles career. Oh, wait, we'll give him the Money in the Bank briefcase. There's your push to the moon. Now prove yourself. I have no problem with them giving, quote unquote, Otis the briefcase because being the hot act, now you have one of the top gimmick prizes of wrestling, and that's a contract to cash in whenever you want uh, at whatever title you want. All right. Nick, you want to go first on this one? No, you go first. Okay. <laughs> I was ready to go first. I just wanted to make sure. I didn't want to step on yeah, you. Yeah, you were trying to be polite. Yeah, we got it. I was. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, All right, so <laughs> the, the reason that Otis um, – I don't believe that Otis should have gotten the briefcase quite yet or this year anyway is that I think if – this is one of one of those tag teams where they're in a division that the tag team is really hurting. And I, I think I said this in our unknown episode that no one will ever see, but the the tag team division right now is a joke. And you have your, your tag team champions playing basketball on, on TV instead of competing for the title and putting the titles up on the line. So now you're just breaking up another good tag team just because, all right, he got, he got over. But what's that leave Tucker? What's that leave another team in your tag team division? I think you they need to put more of an emphasis on that division and taking Otis away and making him a single star. Yeah, it's going to make a money, but you're killing this tag team wrestling for WWE and especially on that show. And I just think it was the wrong time to start to you know, continue to kill the tag team division. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> well, I want to like. I feel like it was, the, of course, it was the, you know it was the right decision for Otis to win, um, because who who's who's to say that he's not going to cash it in and with the tag belts and become tag and put the tag belts on the map, you know, back on the map, you know. So he can cash that he can cash that briefcase in for any for any for any championship, correct? Yes. Yes. So he like you him being so over, and also the tag team's over. That's how that that could fix that solution. Also him being him working hard and getting over with the with the fans and who know I'm not sure about his merch sales and stuff like that. But I mean, everyone loves him, you know. And he's busting his ass. He's doing the right thing. The guy is an athlete like to the top notch. He can go and there's a lot of things you could do with this guy, man. Like like he can. Like I said before, he could be a suplex machine if, the, if his head gets hit right the right way and all of a sudden he snaps into it. You know? <laughs> so I, I feel like it was the correct decision on a lot of levels. All right. It was a really historic Money in the Bank match that took place in a kind of a setting that was quite unique and everything about it was something that's going to be memorable and something to remember. And I think that it could have been the opportunity to launch a legitimate 
big time push for somebody using that story and that what everything that happened there. What I see happening with the storyline for Otis is kind of a um, a hot shot, and it's to pay off the Mandy Rose story, and not necessarily for the long term benefit of what the company can get from something like the Money in the Bank match. And the Money in the Bank ladder match and that briefcase is the focus of attention and literally treated as if it's somebody's most prized possession. And when it's finally used for that cash in the story, it is so great and so unforgettable that I would hate to see it be used for transition and fodder to end a love romance storyline. So. All right. I like that. Um, all right, so we have one left. One question remains. And I, I, I'm glad because I wanted this one to be last, and thank God no one picked it when we were doing the number thing. So this last one is AEW fans. Um, for the most part, a lot of them are blindly optimistic and think that AEW is the best thing going. They can do no wrong. Is this mindset a positive or a negative? Who gets the first one? Uh, so we get we get the first one. You get first dip, right? Lives. Yeah. Uh, Vic, you want to pick positive or negative for them being overly optimistic? I think we'll go with positive. Okay. Being a good thing. Okay. Um, I'll go first, I guess. Yeah, that's fine. I think that having a fan base that is that passionate and that optimistic about the product can only be beneficial for – what they're trying to do in the long run. They know that they have a group of fans that literally will be there ride or die all the way to the end, and it allows them to invest in wrestlers for the future. It, invows, it allows them to invest in the company for the future because they know that they have this core group of people that are so optimistic that they're going to give you so much rope in the whole world for you to go out there and, you know, Screw it up. So they have not been perfect this whole time, but they also have had a fan base that has kind of been online soldiers for them and the most vocal for this new movement that they're trying to create. And make no mistake about it, going viral and creating this kind of a buzz and this kind of a brand and the amount of time that they did requires the mobilization of an army. And they have that. So, you know, as much as we sometimes could be bothered by their optimism or the, how much they put it out there in our face, it's also the, one of the most valuable assets the AEW has. All right. Hell, you want to take this first go? Uh, yeah, just repeat the question one more time. So uh, AEW fans a lot of times can come off very optimistic, very nothing is wrong in the AEW world. Is there – is their optimism a positive or a negative? So for you guys, it would be a negative. Um, yeah, I feel like it's a negative because you don't know what's good and what's not. You know, if they're just going to cheer for everything, um, it'll separate the people that are looking for the things that, you know, they shouldn't be, you know, shouldn't be cheered. So it's, I just feel, you know, a lot of Band-Aids can be covered up with the fans uh, cheering, you know, and uh, there's not like a, a big real picture here. Um. And also, I feel like those kind of fans fizzle out. You know, they just, they just, oh, this is the new thing until another new thing comes, you know. So they really got to get the fans that understand both, you know. And um, so I think they should just be, work towards being on point, you know, going from here on out. You know? Okay. Um, I think if you're going, if you're looking at it as, okay, they, they love everything we do. <clears throat> So that makes them less knowledgeable because they might be cheering for everything um, or might they just be pulling something positive out of everything they see, even though there are some things that they, yeah, they make mistakes, but as a new company, the leaps and bounds that they have grown compared to other companies that have started up and failed or older companies that are failing and, and can't really get that you have these fans that are rooting for this company and, and bring in, really bringing it for them. 
and helping them come along because you really need that. And if they're pulling positives at a lot of the negatives, like, like maybe a, a commentator that maybe doesn't live up to what he used to, but yet they still see the good in uh, an Excalibur or something like that. They're always there and they're always going to support you. So having that, I think it is a real positive and probably drives your wrestling show and drives your wrestlers uh, in the ring. All right. So we're, we're playing for the long game. This company wants to play for the long game and, and outlast any other company that tried to do it and run head to head with, WWE. Now, if you have a fan base that is always overly optimistic and doesn't take criticism too well, you're going to shun those that want to be fans but have some critiques and they have some criticisms about your product that you don't want to hear. So those fans will now drive the fans that have a level head that can see both sides away. So you're pushing people away from the product that you want the most eyes on, but you can't get fully committed because you're told that everything is great, everything is awesome, and everyone has to like all of this. So those fan base that are always overly optimistic tend to draw draw away and push away the ones that want to watch it, but also want to put their two cents in. Like, well, why did they do it this way? Why did they do it that way? I mean, they question the product when it's not good. The people that are overly optimistic are going to tell you that it's great no matter what when – you don't really think it is and then come at you when you have a different opinion. So I think the long game, that doesn't work in their favor. I think always being optimistic and having a fan base that is rah, rah cheerleader for you all the time is just going to throw, is going to, it's going to turn people off. All right. Oh, that was good. That was really good. <laughs> You're lucky you saved it from your Dribble, what was that? <laughs> it would see. <laughs> like what? <laughs> well, that's uh, all right. He was there to confuse, and I was there to ram it home. It's what a good tag partner does. Brother. That's it. <laughs> he didn't punch me in the face though when he went for the tag. <laughs> Never happened. That's our bond. <laughs> no, it didn't because that fucking episode disappeared. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wait. Wait, you can't focus. Go a little closer. Oh, bright. Can't see what it is. Oh, there you go. Oh, there it is. <laughs> wow. What is it? Ravishing Rick Moranis. <laughs> Dude, this is going to be replaced with a funny dress. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna need that picture. I want that as my next background. <laughs> that was a uh, James Vanderbeek made that on Twitter. That guy's awesome. Yeah, he, we yeah. follow him. He follows us. Yeah, he's pretty good. good. Yeah, he should. Yeah. He should give you guys a fucking shirt idea for your next T-shirts. I, he's actually offered a few times. I just haven't got to uh, follow through with him. So I think I might. He's a good dude. Fuck, just take that one. Be rav- ravishing Rick Moranis is in the now. <laughs> it's so the Sigourney Weaver types that had me fucking wrong. <laughs> next, next level thinking there. Dude, yeah. that is. Yeah. That's really good. <laughs> well, that's it. We the, only, the only thing that would have been better if it was like Ed O'Neill throwing back the little giants. <laughs> I like that one better. <laughs> yeah, we're showing the, our age. age yeah. Age. They put ice on the place. Yes. Like, like, what are they talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Ghostbusters, you had a thing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was intense. It was intense. Dude, if people don't know Ghostbusters, they're definitely not living in the Yeah, no. Yeah, 80s movies we have to discuss one day, though. That's got to be a topic we dive into because all if of us we, have much different genres that we are all into. So, If we throw a a special out that we just talk 80s and 90s movies, I think that that might go three hours. Yeah. What we call it, like, so not now? Oh. Living in the now, so not now. (laughs) All right. Well, you heard it here first. We This is going to have to happen now. (laughs) It's on the recording. We can't not follow through with this. Yeah, it's called accountability, brother. (laughs) (laughs) 
So, uh, guys, that, that was it. We went through all seven. Um, thank you so much for contributing. It was a lot of fun. And, it's so hard uh, not having a rebuttal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we would be here a while if we would keep re- going back and forth, though. That's the only problem. I was like, good point, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the that's the only thing that it keeps you true to your word. You you got to kind of come up with your points. Yeah, well, now we now we shut down and be like, motherfucker, I should have said that. I should have said this. <laughs> <laughs> that's what Twitter is for. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, and speaking of Twitter, to vote on who won this debate today, go on our Twitter, which will be pinned to the top of our uh, profile on Facebook as well. Obviously, me and Vic have won, but. Vote for anyone you want on those pinned tweets and uh, pinned uh, posts on Facebook. And let Wait, us- did you just say obviously me and Vic had won? Me, me and Vic oh, yeah. won. I mean, it's just pretty clear, but I mean, it's Wait, fine. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. I mean, how did that slip by? That, there is no way in hell you guys won. There's no way. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't even close, so I don't know what you guys are talking about. But <laughs> we'll, we'll, let the, we'll let the fans fucking decide this one. Yeah. Yeah. Don't try and subliminal message them and fucking say you won. <laughs> we all know the oh, there's, all now. there's the right answer, and then there's, you know, you guys, so. Yeah, we're team now, you're team never. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> all right, guys, uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight, and um, we love having you guys on, and hopefully uh, we'll be doing this on another episode. So thank you so can much. You, can yeah. you make sure you uh, save it when we get done? Just make, It's like uh, save as, I think. <laughs> I deserve that. I deserve that. I'll take it. I'll take it. Inside jokes. Inside yeah. jokes. I'll take that one. I'll take that one. With you. I love you guys. This is so All much right. fun. Thank you for having us. No thank problem. you, guys. Thanks, guys.